Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's uh, good to be back here with you once again. I hope you've had a good week. And uh, the grass is certainly starting to look more lush, I think, with all the rain that we've had. But it still feels like four seasons in one day. I don't know about you, but uh, I have to carry a jacket, I have to carry an umbrella and, uh, and a hat just in case the weather changes. But um, it's certainly been nice and uh, it's still cool so you can get out and, and get moving and you don't get too, uh, too hot during the day. So um, it's been nice here uh, in Canberra. I went out with my son and my wife and we went out and visited some friends last week and uh, we managed to catch up with them in the park. And um, I just want to share this little story because as we drove up to the park, my son could see his friend in the playground. And, uh, and we came up and we parked the car and he got out of the car and we got out of the car and we got the bags and stuff for the picnic. And um, my son got out of the car, he closed the door and he sort of bolted towards the park. And, uh, you know, we kind of looked over and to see what he was doing and he was looking for his friend. And he was looking all around for his friend and then he spotted him. And his friend spotted my son. And it's almost like, you know, they caught each other out. But they started to, to run towards each other. And, um, you know, me and my wife were just watching on. But, you know, as they ran towards each other, they hugged each other. And it was the best thing you could possibly see. Um, you know, there was no sort of rules around hugging or, or anything. Um, you know, these guys were just so happy to see each other. And I feel like, I hope that we can get back to that stage again where we just run up to each other and, and hug each other and say hello. Um, but until then, we've got to mask up. We've got to keep our social distancing. So, um, but I don't think it's too far away. Hey, let's, uh, let's pray this morning as we invite God's presence. Lord, we just want to pause again, Lord, um, to say thank you for uh, bringing us through another week. Uh, we pray that um, as we, Lord, as we open your word this Sabbath, we pray that you may be with us. May your presence, Lord, um, be in every home, be in every home that is watching this, Lord. I pray that um, as we go through this message, Lord, that it may touch our hearts. We may learn something from it as well, Lord, to constantly look towards you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, or this afternoon, I'd like to start off by putting this up on the screen. Do you remember what this is? Does it look familiar to you? So before GPS, before 5G phones, before SatNav, even before Google Earth, before all of that, you had this the reliable, trusty roadmap. And the only way to know where anything was was to use one of these. And we've got to go back to, you know, a couple of years. But you would have to get the most up-to-date roadmap. Why? Because if you had the latest edition, you would be able to find the streets. I guess if they had put up a new street during the year or something, you would be able to, to locate that. So you needed the latest edition of the roadmap. Now, these roadmaps are still around. In fact, you can find them in your service stations. And some people actually even use them today. There's no, I'm not saying don't use them. They're reliable, they're trusty, and some of uh, people have them in their cars today. I remember when we had a map ourselves and I would always be the co-driver. I'd be the one reading the map. Um, and you remember how it worked. You remember how the, the, the map would work. You would have to find your street name in the front or the back of the map and then you would have to remember the coordinates relating to that street name. And then you would open up your map to the page number 
and then you would use the corresponding coordinates against the name of your street. And I remember clearly, you would open up the page, then you would go up the, right, the left-hand side of the page and look for the, the alphabet, and then go across down the bottom of the page and look for the number. And then where those two intersected is where your street was. And not only that, well, that was the first bit. The second bit, you would have to find the other street and then you would do the same, and then you would draw this line. I would always draw this line across from one place to the other place. But that's how we would use the map to find our streets. So road maps were reliable, and you kept them safely. I remember it was so big, and you would keep them in the sort of your glove box or in your um, compartment under, under the chair. They were vital in providing the direction to get from one location to another. The notion of roadmaps is still around. In our current situation, governments and states are providing roadmaps to illustrate how to navigate coming out of lockdown. In fact, the latest roadmap for ACT provides a pathway forward to gradually resuming life pre-COVID. So here we see that roadmaps are helpful. They're helpful because they provide pathways to help stabilize society. We also see that roadmaps are implemented on a national scale now. We see that with the ACT roadmap, and you have the New South Wales roadmap, and so forth. I want us to go to the next slide, because here we start to see that roadmaps are not only on a local scale, and on a national scale, but roadmaps are being proposed on a global scale. Notice here in the Fratelli Tutti, the third encyclical released last year by Pope Francis, talking about a need for a shared roadmap. Notice here what it says. Globalization and progress without a shared roadmap. Notice what it goes on to say. In today's world, isolation and withdrawal into one's own interests are never the way to restore hope and bring about renewal. Rather, it is closeness. It is the culture of encounter. Isolation, no. Closeness, yes. Culture clash, no. Culture of encounter, yes. We're starting to talk about coming together closely to encounter together. Notice what it goes on to say. In this world that races ahead, yet lacks a shared roadmap. Notice the language being used. There's an urgency to establish a shared roadmap. In this world that races ahead, yet lacks a shared roadmap, we increasingly sense that the gap between concern for one's personal well-being and the prosperity of the larger human family seems to be stretching to a point of complete diversion between individuals and the human community. In other words, there is an emphasis on having a shared roadmap that brings together individuals and community. 
Why? So there's no gap. Notice the last bit here. Unless we recover the shared passion to increase a community of belonging and solidarity worthy of our time, our energy, and our resources, the global illusion that misled us will collapse and leave many in the grip of anguish and emptiness. There is an emphasis on solidarity. There is an emphasis on coming together, coming together for humanity's sake, for the common good. So we are more inclined to have a shared roadmap. This encyclical is saying unless we have a unified roadmap, society will collapse. A globalized roadmap has to be inclusive of all communities, again, under the umbrella for the common good. So we've seen local roadmaps. We've seen a national roadmap. Now we're starting to see a global road, roadmap. I want us to continue. Notice here that many of the religious leaders have praised the global roadmap. In fact, here, if you have a look, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar, Al, let me say that again, Al Azhar, praises the Pope's letter. He praises the encyclical. Now, the Grand Imam is regarded by some as the highest authority of the Islamic faith. Notice what he goes on to say. The encyclical is an appeal to create a true fraternity where there is no discrimination on the basis of differences of religion, race, gender, no other forms of intolerance. He's saying there needs to be a unification. He's actually welcoming the idea of a shared roadmap. So religious leaders are unifying to create a joint roadmap again under this banner of common good. A globalized roadmap uniting the world. I wanted to go here because I just want to say don't get me wrong, I'm all for roadmaps, I support roadmaps. But man's roadmap is a local size in comparison to God's roadmap, which is a universal, colossal size. What exactly the roadmap, put quite simply, is the Word of God. This is God's roadmap. God's roadmap supersedes any of man's roadmaps. Hebrews 2, as you see on the screen, verse 17, tells us of this roadmap. Notice what it says here. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propriation for the sins of the people. In other words, when mankind fell, there was a clear roadmap by God 
to send his son Jesus. Notice what the verse says. He takes on humanity. He's made like his brothers. He takes on humanity, becomes our high priest, who also then intercedes for humanity by offering himself as a living sacrifice for us all. His roadmap lays out the plan of salvation to a lost world. God's roadmap is laid out for mankind. I wanted to make a connection. I want to sort of transition now because I want to make a connection between roadmap and worship. I'm going to suggest that worship is actually embedded into God's roadmap for mankind. Here's why I say this. I'd like to go to the book of Joshua. If you're with me, please go to the book of Joshua. Joshua. Verses, uh, sorry, Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I want to make this connection that God's roadmap incorporates worship. I want us to go here. Joshua chapter 4. We've been going through or journeying through the book of Joshua. And it's been, we, we've been able to see how the, the children of Israel were to go into the promised land. Joshua, and we began at Joshua chapter 1, and we've made our way through to Joshua chapter 4. We go to Joshua chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, and I'll bring it up on the screen now. When all the nation had passed, had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people. From each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones here, from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, and from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight." Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, when the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. So you remember the story. They had crossed over into the Jordan. We went through that beautiful illustration where God was going to lead the way before them. In fact, God was not only going to lead the way, He was going to be in the midst of the Jordan until they all safely pass through. And then we started to cover as they went through and how God would lead them and actually God would actually go before them to clear the pathway. This was all a part of God's plan. 
And we figured out how the Israelites were to consecrate themselves. Remember that before going across. And now we see that they've gone across. They've crossed over the Jordan. Remember, God's roadmap was to get them from Egypt to the promised land. Once they had crossed over the Jordan River, the very next thing set up an altar to commemorate God. So Joshua, we find here in the story, Joshua ordered the men to get stones from the dry riverbed, stones that would not be moved. That's a symbol for us. Stones that would not be moved. Now, Pastor Andrew and I did some carrying this week. In fact, they, uh, they called us up. They called the, the two strongest men in all of Canberra. They called us up so we would go and help, uh, offer our help to move. And we went to uh, a friend's place uh, one of the members' place, and we actually offered them to, we actually offered to, to help them move their stuff. And, uh, you know, we moved couches and boxes of things and food and dresses and uh, dryers and uh, beds and all sorts of things. Um, but the key was, the key was having a hand truck. And so we had this hand truck, and so the weight was mostly distributed upon the, the hand truck instead of us, and, um, and, that was a, and that was nice. So it took the load off us. It actually took the strain of us, of our back, um, and it was all on this hand truck that we used. But it's different when you don't have a hand truck and you have to carry something yourself. Imagine Joshua orders these mighty men to pick up these huge boulders and then by themselves, no hand truck, to lift these big boulders and to place them in an altar. Twelve stones to represent twelve tribes of Israel. The stones were to be set up in such a way that they were never to be removed. But why? Verse 6. Have a look at verse 6. What does it say? That these stones were to be a sign to the future generations. It was to remind them of how God had delivered them. So they're on their way. To wherever, when they passed the altars of the stones, they would pause to recall God's providence for them. Now, there were actually two altars that were set up. It was to often remind the children of Israel who would forget, they would consistently forget. So the altars, two of them, were set up to remind them not to forget of how God had led them in the past. The stones were to be, memorialize His liberation for them. So imagine God laying out this map, and you would see Egypt. Then you would see a trail down to the Red Sea. Then you would see a trail across into the wilderness. Then you would see a trail down to the Jordan River. Then you would see a trail across the river into the promised land. That trail wouldn't end. That trail would continue into worship, into the promised land. Notice here, what side of the river were they on? They're on the side of the river of the, of the, they're on the side of the promised land that crossed over. Notice here again that they would continue to worship on the side of the promised land. 
so too we are continue to worship God in heavenly Canaan. We are to worship God in the promised land. There are so many texts in the Bible that could sum up the roadmap of God. There's John 3.16. It's a, it's a, it's a most uh, familiar text, and it goes something like this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are many more texts in the Bible where it could sum up the roadmap of God. But this is my favorite. Hebrews 2 verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Why? To make propriation for the sins of the people. God's roadmap is not only to show us how to get from point A to point B, from Egypt to Canaan, from heaven, from earth, sorry, to heaven. But his roadmap is also to be a memorial for all of mankind. How are we to respond to God's roadmap? His roadmap draws an appreciation from us. And so we show our appreciation in the form of worship. So how do we respond? By worshiping God. I want to close there. Because next week I will go into more detail what worshiping God looks like. This roadmap that God gives us supersedes every other roadmap. But why is worshiping so important? Why is worshiping a part of God's roadmap? Why is it so important? We'll have a look at that next Sabbath. Raise your hand. If you are too happy, if you are happy to have God's roadmap in your life, me too. Let's pray as we close. Lord, you have given us so much. Father, your Son who has died for us, but also, Lord, you have given us your word. That is this roadmap, Lord, on how, Lord, you had made this world perfect. And then how sin came in, Lord. And how you put a plan into place to redeem man back into a right standing with God. And how, Lord, you're coming back again to collect your people. We thank you, Lord, for this road map that is clear to us. And we pray, Lord, that as we look in more detail, Lord, of, of worship and how it aligns, Lord, perfectly with your will, we pray that we may have more understanding around it and to be able, Lord, to follow it, to be able, Lord, to follow your roadmap that supersedes any other. This is our prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.